we believe in drugs as a society and culture. And so into that kind of cultural framework, if psychiatry comes along and says that our drugs work and they're backed by huge amounts of money from pharmaceutical companies through funding of the American Psychiatric Association, through funding of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, through funding of their thought leaders, um, and so on, funding of psychiatric departments, um, and so that they can create um, the image that they are a legitimate authority who has drugs that are safe, effective, that's going to work culturally. Part of the terrifying thing, or it should be terrifying for our culture and our society, is that increasing numbers of children who are just behaving well within the range of normal child behavior are being pathologized or being medicalized. So there are several examples of this, most obvious for me, starting in 1980 with these oppositional defiant disorder, ODD. This sounds like you're pathologizing childhood. You're pathologizing rebellion, adolescent resistance, noncompliance. This seems highly problematic. Archives of General Psychiatry, a couple of years back, discovers that there's a seven-fold increase in children under 13 on antipsychotic drugs. Seroquel, Risperdal, Zyprexa, these heavily tranquilizing drugs. And they discover that the majority of these kids, around 63% of these kids, who are being put on antipsychotic drugs are not psychotic, but given our diagnoses of these disruptive behavioral disorders like oppositional defiant disorder. And you know something? The more you talk about your problems, the easier they are to solve. It's uh, bottling things up inside that's bad. As opposed to what real helpers, a more legitimate mental health profession, would be helping parents to learn how that you do form relationships where you can gain the level of respect in a way that you don't create resentment and that these are normal phases, especially in adolescence, but also even younger for many of these kids, that if you deal with them right, you can strengthen family relationships. When you're trying to coerce a child, coerce a teenager to be something that they're not, um, and especially through the use of things like medication where they, f they feel like they were completely unloved and uncared about for who they were. They were being tried to be molded into something who they weren't to be able to fit in more easily to create less tension in a family or in a society. The legitimacy of psychiatry's uh, process of how uh, people are diagnosed um, is being called into question in major ways. Um, it's not any longer just people who are dissonant mental health professionals who are speaking out against mainstream psychiatry. Mainstream psychiatry itself realizes they have gone so far, especially with the more recent DSM-5, where grief itself is now being pathologized, that people who are mainstream establishment psychiatrists, people like Thomas Insel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health, is saying, said in 2013, we're not going to be using the DSM psychiatry's diagnostic Bible anymore in our research. Alan Francis, who is the task force director of DSM-4, so embarrassed by this expansionism, this sort of imperialism of diagnoses, uh, you know, making fun of psychiatry as just being a tool for drug companies. The chair of the DSM-3 task force, a guy named Robert Spitzer, also embarrassed that psychiatry is no longer looking at the context of how these behaviors are happening, just taking a look at symptoms and needlessly pathologizing. So you're talking about three of the most major um, establishment psychiatry figures in the last 30 years, they are distancing themselves from the whole diagnostic procedure. So that's one aspect to the extent that we can get across to the general public that in terms of these diagnoses themselves, they're illegitimate scientifically. They have no value. They're not valid and they're not reliable. Even if you believe in things like oppositional defiant disorder, it cannot be reliably diagnosed. Kids act differently with different people. Um, there's no blood test and there's no EEG. There's nothing like that that stays consistent and so their behaviors change. And so the, the questioning the legitimacy of psychiatry's diagnostic procedures and we questioning the effectiveness of their treatment, which a lot of more, more establishment psychiatrists, psychologists 
are willing to do nowadays. It's more mainstream to question the fact that antidepressants don't seem to work in aggregate much better than placebo sugar pills. Uh, people have now delegitimized a lot of these biochemical imbalance theories. It's more mainstream establishment psychiatrists like Ronald Pease um, have talked about like, well, this stuff is just, we've always known it's urban legend that there is no biochemical brain imbalance theory. The major theory that, by the way, was used to sell all of these serotonin um, reuptake inhibitor type of drugs like Prozac, Paxil, Zolo. So on many areas, one aspect, one prong of changing it all is getting across to the general public that even establishment psychiatry figures are now embarrassed by the lack of science in psychiatry, and it really has not a, it is, it is not to be seen as an, an, a legitimate scientific pursuit. So you have a situation in America where you have school shootings that are horrific, nightmarish for many parents out there in all of society. You have uh, soldiers um, running amok on, uh, on bases or, and, and, and not only shooting others, uh, huge numbers of suicides happening out there, uh, more than are taking place in actual combat, more deaths in, from suicides than combat. So you have all of these frightening, terrifying things for family, for society, even for institutions like the military. And so they're overwhelmed by fear and they're vulnerable, all of us human beings, when we're in a state of fear, we're vulnerable to somebody coming along and, and looking like their authority. And that's the key word, looking or appearing, not really being a legitimate scientific authority, but having the capacity to sort of market oneself, sell oneself as an authority that could come in here and fix your problem. Um, and so most people um, don't know a lot of the scientific research. And so when politicians or even family members are overwhelmed by fear and somebody appears like an authority and says like, I have the answer here, more treatment, more drugs, more hospitalizations, more coercive, making people, these people we can predict who are violent and we can control them so it doesn't happen. All these things that are completely not true, they're, they're, people are vulnerable because they're frightened. And this is true in, in, in societies in general. Uh, another part of like how, what we must do to prevent that is to, inform people that, that their fear is legitimate, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to trust people who look like they know what they're talking about when they have a, a long history, a long track record of like almost getting nothing right. Okay, um, and so this is this is this is hard to do because the airwaves, the media are controlled by people who have the most money which in the case of the mental health profession, the big money in the mental health profession is drug company money. And so drug companies want a certain message to be gotten out there. If enough people use their drugs and enough of their drugs are being used out there, th that will certainly fix the problem. You know, take a look in the military, for example, one out of six of these soldiers are on some kind of psychiatric drug. And we have huge numbers of, so of suicide going on, huge numbers of, of violent behavior. Um, it's not working there. They are being treated. These teenage shooters, we know many of these teenage shooters, some of the most famous ones, they have been treated psychiatrically. The case, for example, a high profile case in Columbine. Eric Harris was on uh, the drug Lovix. Antidepressant was found in his bloodstream. Well, the manufacturer of Lovix, Solvay, they admitted 4% of kids who are on these antidepressants have a manic reaction. Manic mean poor judgment, impulsive, likely to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, that's what the manufacturer is admitting. Most people say it's more like about 10% of folks who are on these antidepressants or some of these other drugs, these Adderall, and uh, amphetamine, ADHD kind of drugs. There's also a lot of these kids get manic off of that. And so we know study after study that, that you're going to take kids who have mild problems or moderate problems and in many cases, okay, and when you're talking about millions of kids being on antidepressants, even if the manu go with the manufacturer's number of 4%, you got four, over 40,000 kids who are potentially going to be manic. I think that that's the kind of stuff that we just have to work to get out there.